Chapter 15 of The Life and Adventures of Nat Love, also known as Deadwood Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Adventures of Nat Love, written by Nat Love. Chapter 15 On a trip to Dodge City, Kansas, I rope one of Uncle Sam's cannon. Captured by the soldiers, Bat Masterson to my rescue, Lost on the Prairie, Cater the Buffalo Hunter, My Horse Gets Away and Leaves Me Alone on the Prairie, The Blizzard, Frozen Stiff. In the spring of 1877, now fully recovered from the effects of the very serious wounds I had received at the hands of the Indians, and feeling my old self again, I joined the boys in their first trip of the season with a herd of cattle for Dodge City. The trip was uneventful until we reached our destination. This was the first time I had been in Dodge City since I had won the name of Deadwood Dick, and many of the boys who knew me when I first joined the cowboys there in 1869 were there to greet me now. After our herd had been delivered to their new owners, we started out to properly celebrate the event, and for a space of several days we kept the old town on the jump. And so, when we finally started for home, all of us had more or less of the bad whiskey of Dodge City under our belts, and were feeling rather spirited and ready for anything. I probably had more of the bad whiskey of Dodge City than anyone, and was in consequence feeling very reckless, but we had about exhausted our resources of amusement in the town, and so were looking for trouble on the trail home. On our way back to Texas, our way led past Old Fort Dodge. Seeing the soldiers and the cannon in the fort, a bright idea struck me, but a fool one just the same. It was no less than a desire to rope one of the cannons. It seemed to me that it would be a good thing to rope a cannon and take it back to Texas with us to fight Indians with. The bad whiskey which I carried under my belt was responsible for the fool idea, and gave me the nerve to attempt to execute the idea. Getting my lariat rope ready, I rode to a position just opposite the gate of the fort, which was standing open. Before the gate paced a sentry with his gun on his shoulder and his white gloves showing up clean and white against the dusty gray surroundings. I waited until the sentry had passed the gate, then, putting spurs to my horse, I dashed straight for and through the gate into the yard. The surprised sentry called halt, but I paid no attention to him. Making for the cannon at full speed, my rope left my hand and settled square over the cannon. Then turning and putting spurs to my horse, I tried to drag the cannon after me, but strain as he might, my horse was unable to budge it an inch. In the meantime, the surprised sentry at the gate had given the alarm, and now I heard the bugle sound, boots, and saddles, and glancing around I saw the soldiers mounting to come after me, and finding I could not move the cannon, I rode close up to it and got my lariat off, then made for the gate again at full speed. The guard jumped in front of me with his gun up, calling halt, but I went by him like a shot, expecting to hear the crack of his musket but for some reason he failed to fire on me, and I made for the open prairie with the cavalry in hot pursuit. My horse could run like a wild deer, but he was no match for the big, strong, fresh horses of the soldiers, and they soon had me. Relieving me of my arms, they placed me in the guardhouse, where the commanding officer came to see me. He asked me who I was and what I was after at the fort. I told him, and then he asked me if I knew anyone in the city. I told him I knew Bat Masterson. He ordered two guards to take me to the city to see Masterson. As soon as Masterson saw me, he asked me what the trouble was, and before I could answer, the guards told him I rode into the fort and roped one of the cannons and tried to pull it out. Bat asked me what I wanted with the cannon and what I intended doing with it. I told him I wanted to take it back to Texas with me to fight the Indians with. Then they all laughed. Then Bat told him that I was all right, the only trouble being that I had too much bad whiskey under my shirt. They said I would have to set the drinks for the house. They came to fifteen dollars, and when I started to pay for them, Bat said for me to keep my money that he would pay for them himself, which he did. Bat said that I was the only cowboy that he liked, and that his brother Jim also thought very much of me. I was then let go, and I joined the boys, and we continued on our way home, where we arrived safely on the 1st of June, 1877. We at once began preparing for the coming big round-up. 
As usual, this kept us very busy during the months of July and August, and as we received no more orders for cattle this season, we did not have to take the trail again. But after the round-up was over, we were kept busy in range-riding and the general all-around work of the big cattle ranch. We had at this time on the ranch upwards of 30,000 head of cattle, our own cattle, not to mention the cattle belonging to the many other interests throughout the Panhandle country, as all these immense herds used the range of the country in common, as there was no fences to divide the ranches. Consequently, the cattle belonging to the different herds often got mixed up, and large numbers of them strayed. At the roundups, it was our duty to cut out and brand the young calves, take a census of our stock, and then, after the roundup was over, we would start out to look for possible strays. Over the range we would ride through canyons and gorges and every place where it was possible for cattle to stray, as it was important to get them with the main herd before winter set in, as if left out in small bunches there was danger of them perishing in the frequent hard storms of the winter. While range riding or hunting for strays, we always carried with us on our saddle the branding irons of our respective ranches, and whenever we ran across a calf that had not been branded, we had to rope the calf, tie it, then a fire was made of buffalo chips, the only fuel besides grass to be found on the prairie. The irons were heated and the calf was branded with the brand of the finder, no matter who it personally belonged to. It now became the property of the finder. The lost cattle were then driven to the main herd. After they were once gotten together, it was our duty to keep them together during the winter and early spring. It was while out hunting strays that I got lost, the first and only time I was ever lost in my life, and for four days I had an experience that few men ever went through and lived, as it was a close pull for me. I had been out for several days looking for lost cattle and becoming separated from the other boys and being in a part of the country unfamiliar to me. It was stormy when I started out from the home ranch, and when I had ridden about a hundred miles from home, it began to storm in earnest. Rain, hail, sleet, and the clouds seemed to touch the earth and gather in their impenetrable embrace everything thereon. For a long time I rode on in the direction of home, but as I could not see fifty yards ahead it was a case of going at blind. After riding for many weary hours through the storm, I came across a little log cabin on the Palador River. I rode up to within one hundred yards of it, where I was motioned to stop by an old long-haired man who stepped out of the cabin door with a long buffalo gun on his arm. It was with this he had motioned me to stop. I promptly pulled up and raised my hat, which, according to the custom of the cowboy country, gave him to understand I was a cowboy from the western cow ranges. He then motioned me to come on. Riding up to the cabin, he asked me to dismount, and we shook hands. He said, when I saw you coming, I said to myself, that must be a lost cowboy from some of the western cow ranges. I told him I was lost all right, and I told him who I was and where from. Again we shook hands, he saying, as we did so, that we were friends until we met again, and he hoped forever. He then told me to pick it out my horse and come in and have some supper, which very welcome invitation I accepted. His cabin was constructed of rough-hewn logs, somewhat after the fashion of a Spanish blockhouse. One part of it was constructed underground, a sort of dugout, while the upper portion of the cabin proper was provided with many loopholes commanding every direction. He later told me these loopholes had stood him in handy many a time when he had been attacked by Indians in their efforts to capture him. On entering his cabin I was amazed to see the walls covered with all kinds of skins, horns, and antlers. Buffalo skins in great numbers covered the floor and bed, while the walls were completely hidden behind the skins of every animal of that region, including a large number of rattlesnake skins and many of their rattles. His bed, which was in one corner of the dugout, was of skins, and to me, weary from my long ride through the storm, seemed to be the most comfortable place on the globe just then. He soon set before me a bounteous supper, consisting of buffalo meat and corn dodgers, and seldom before have I enjoyed a meal as I did that one. During supper he told me many of his experiences in the western country. His name was Cater, and he was one of the oldest buffalo hunters in that part of Texas, having hunted and trapped over the wild country ever since the early thirties, and during that time he had many a thrilling adventure with Indians and wild animals. I stayed with him that night and slept soundly on a comfortable bed he made for me. 
The next morning he gave me a good breakfast, and I prepared to take my departure, as the storm had somewhat moderated, and I was anxious to get home, as the boys, knowing I was out, would be looking for me if I did not show up in a reasonable time. My kind host told me to go directly northwest, and I would strike the Cologne's Flats, a place with which I was perfectly familiar. He said it was about seventy-five miles from his place. Once there, I would have no difficulty in finding my way home. Cater put me up a good lunch to last me on my way, and with many expressions of gratitude to him, I left him with his skins and comfortable, though solitary, life. All that day and part of the night I rode in the direction he told me until about eleven o'clock, when I became so tired I decided to go into camp and give my tired horse a rest and a chance to eat. Accordingly I dismounted and removed the saddle and bridle from my horse. I hobbled him and turned him loose to graze on the luxuriant grass, while I, tired out, laid down with my head on my saddle, fully dressed as I was, not even removing my belt containing my forty-five pistol from my waist, laying my Winchester close by. The rain had ceased to fall, but it was still cloudy and threatening. It was my intention to rest a few hours, then continue on my way, and as I could not see the stars on account of the clouds, and as it was important that I keep my direction northwest in order to strike the flats, I had carefully taken my direction before sundown, and now, on moving my saddle, I placed it on the ground, pointing in the direction I was going when I stopped, so that it would enable me to keep my direction when I again started out. I had been laying there for some time, and my horse was quietly grazing about twenty yards off, when I suddenly heard something squeal. It sounded like a woman's voice. It frightened my horse, and he ran for me. I jumped to my feet with my Winchester in my hand. This caused my horse to rear and wheel, and I heard his hobbles break with a sharp snap. Then I heard the sound of his galloping feet going across the panhandle plains, until the sound was lost in the distance. Then I slowly began to realize that I was left alone on the plains on foot. How many miles from home I did not know. Remembering I had my guns all right, it was my impulse to go in pursuit of my horse as I thought I could eventually catch him after he had got over his scare. But then I thought of my forty-pound saddle, and I did not want to leave that, saying to myself, that is the second saddle I ever owned, the other having been taken by the Indians when I was captured, and this saddle was part of the outfit presented to me by the boys. And so, tired and as hungry as a hawk, I shouldered my saddle and started out in the direction I was going when I went into camp, saying to myself as I did so, if my horse could pack me and my outfit day and night, I can at least pack my outfit. Keeping my direction as well as I could, I started out over the prairie through the dark, walking all that night and all the next day without anything to eat or drink, until just about sundown and when I had begun to think I would have to spend another night on the prairie without food or drink, I emerged from a little draw onto a raise on the prairie. Looking over onto a small flat, I saw a large herd of buffalo. These were the first I had seen since I became lost, and the sight of them put renewed life and hope in me, as I was then nearly famished, and when I saw them I knew I had something to eat. Off to one side, about twenty yards from the main herd, and about one hundred and fifty yards from me, was a young calf. Placing my Winchester to my shoulder, I glanced along the shining barrel, but my hand shook so much I lowered it again. Not that I was afraid of missing it, as I knew I was a dead shot at that distance, but my weakness, caused by my long enforced fast and my great thirst, made my eyes dim and my hands shake in a way they had never done before. So, waiting a few moments, I again placed the gun to my shoulder, and this time it spoke, and the calf dropped where it had stood. Picking up my outfit, I went down to where my supper was laying. I took out my jackknife and commenced on one of his hindquarters. I began to skin and eat to my heart's content, but I was so very thirsty. I had heard of people drinking blood to quench their thirst, and that gave me an idea, so cutting the calf's throat with my knife, I eagerly drank the fresh warm blood. It tasted very much like warm, sweet milk. It quenched my thirst and made me feel strong. 
When I had eaten all I could, I cut off two large chunks of the meat and tied them to my saddle. Then, again shouldering the whole thing, I started on my way, feeling almost as satisfied as if I had my horse with me. I was lost two days and two nights after my horse left me, and all that time I kept walking, packing my forty-pound saddle and my Winchester and two cattle pistols. On the second night about daylight the weather became more threatening, and I saw in the distance a long column which looked like smoke. It seemed to be coming towards me at the rate of a mile a minute. It did not take it long to reach me, and when it did I struggled on for a few yards, but it was no use. Tired as I was from packing my heavy outfit for more than forty-eight hours and my long tramp, I had not the strength to fight against the storm. When I again came to myself I was covered up head and foot in the snow in the camp of some of my comrades from the ranch. It seemed from what I was told afterwards that the boys, knowing I was out in the storm and failing to show up, they had started out to look for me. They had gone in camp during the storm, and when the blizzard had passed they noticed an object out on the prairie in the snow, with one hand frozen clenched around my Winchester and the other around the horn of my saddle, and they had hard work to get my hands loose. They picked me up and placed me on one of the horses, and took me to camp, where they stripped me of my clothes and wrapped me up in the snow. All the skin came off my nose and mouth, and my hands and feet had been so badly frozen that the nails all came off. After I had got thawed out in the mess wagon, they took me home. In fifteen days I was again in the saddle, ready for business, but I will never forget those few days I was lost, and the marks of that storm I will carry with me always. End of chapter 15